Hello everyone, let's go on with the course. Next, we're going to talk about something new, which is the generator. What's special about it? All the networks we've learned so far had been functions. Given an input x, it produces an output y. We have learned all kinds of network architectures that can handle different types of inputs and outputs. We have learned about using an image as the input. We also learned about using a sequence as the input. Similarly, we've learned that the output can be a value, a class, or a sequence. The network architectures that we've mentioned in this course should be sufficient for most of the tasks you might face in the future. Now, we are going to enter a new chapter, which is using a network. As a generator, we're going to use the network for deep learning. What's special about using a network as a generator? The main difference is that we will add a random variable, z, to the input. z is sampled from a distribution. This way, the output of the network no longer solely depends on a fixed x. Instead, it now depends on both x and z. You might want to ask about how the network takes x and z into consideration at the same time. There are many different ways to do this, and it all depends on how you design your network architecture. For example, if both x and z are vectors, we can simply concatenate those two to create a longer vector that can be used as the input of the network. That's one way of doing it. Or, if x and z have the same shape, we can just add them together and use the result as the input. This is also viable. What makes z special is that it is not fixed. Every time we use this network, a z is randomly generated. The z we see every time won't be the same since it is sampled from a distribution. There's one restriction on the distribution, which is that the distribution itself must be simple enough. What does it mean by simple enough? By that, it means that we need to know what its formula looks like. We can sample from this distribution. For example, this distribution could be a function distribution. If we know the formula of the function distribution, we can sample from it. We know how to sample from a Gaussian distribution. It could also be a uniform distribution. We definitely know the formula for the uniform distribution. So, we also know how to sample from a uniform distribution. In summary, we can decide the shape of the distribution as long as it is simple and can be sampled from. So, every time we have an input x, we get z by sampling from this distribution. Then, we generate an output as we sample different z. The outputs, y, also change accordingly. Now, the output of the network becomes a complex distribution instead of something fixed. Using the same x as input, different things are sampled every time. After passing it through the network, it goes through a complex transformation and becomes a complex distribution. This way, the output of the network now becomes a distribution. The kind of network that can output a distribution is called a generator. Next, we are going to talk about how to train a generator. Before we talk about that, we would like to answer a question first. Why do we need to train a generator? Why do we need a generator? Weren't fixed input and output good enough already? Why do we need a distribution as an output? So the following is an example to explain to you why the output sometimes needs to be a probable to t distribution. Okay, the example here is video prediction. We give a video to the machine and it has to predict what will happen next. I found this example from the GitHub link above. In this link, what it's going to do is to predict that in the game of Elf, what the next game screen will look like. For people who don't know what an Elf game is, this is a real game screen of the Elf. Okay, so how to make a video prediction? You provide your network with the game screens in the past. Then its output is the new game screen. Its output is the game screen at the next time point at the next second. Then it's finished. It's not difficult at all to get such training data. You just need to keep recording the picture of someone playing the elf. Then you can know that. Given these three frames, what will happen next? You've already had it in your training data. When you have a bunch of recorded videos, you know what will happen next. Given the past information, you can train your network to let its output Y be as close to our goal as possible. 
then it's finished. Someone may ask how to output a picture. This picture is a very long vector. So you just need to make your network output a very long vector. Then this vector is sorted into a picture. The closer you get to your goal, the better it is. Well, actually, this GitHub does not directly use the entire screen as input. It only cuts a small piece from the screen as input. It cuts the whole picture into many pieces and then deals with it separately. However, in order to simplify the explanation, we assume that the network takes a whole picture like this. Okay, but what's the problem with this? You use this method. Using the network training method, we have learned. After training it with supervised learning, the result you get may look like this. This is the result predicted by the machine. So it's a little vague. And it changes the role in the middle. The magical thing is that the elf splits while walking. When it walks to the corner, it splits into two when it reaches the corner. When it walks here, it splits into two again. Sometimes it disappears when walking. Why does the elf split when it walks? That's because today, for this network, for the same input in the training data, with the same corner, sometimes the elf turns left. Sometimes the elf turns right. These two possibilities coexist in your training data. When you are training, the training instruction your network gets is that, given this input, given this training material, it has to learn that given this input, the output should be turning right. Given these training data, sometimes what you will see is turning left. Then the machine will learn that given this piece of input, it's going to turn left. But these two training materials very likely coexist in your training machine. So what your network learns is to please both sides because it needs to get an output. This output is not only the closest to turning left, but also the closest to turning right. How to be the closest to turning left and turning right at the same time? Maybe it's turning left and right at the same time. So your network will get the wrong result. Turning left is correct, turning right is also correct. But turning left and right at the same time is wrong. What's the possible way to handle this problem? One possibility is letting the output of the machine have a probability so that it is no longer a single output. Let it output a probability distribution. When we give this network a distribution, when we give this network an input plus extra z, its output becomes a distribution. Its output is no longer fixed. We hope to train a network which can know the output distribution including the possibility of turning left and the possibility of turning right. For example, we assume you pick your z, which is, for example, a binary random variable. It only includes 0 and 1, which may account for 50% each. Maybe, your network can learn to turn left when z picks 1 and to turn right when z picks 0. Then, it can be solved. There are many unpredictable things in this world such as a situation like this. When will we need to deal with this kind of problem? When will we especially need this generator model? It's the time when our task requires a little creativity. Of course, the task requires a little creativity is a human-like way of saying. To be more specific is that we want to find a function which could have the same input but different possible outputs. And these different outputs are all correct. Since the same input could result in different possible outputs, you need everyone to be able to play independently. Even if it's human to deal with this problem, the answers may be different from person to person. At this time, we say that we let the machine have the ability to create. So, for example, drawing may need some creativity. For example, we ask a person to draw a character with red eyes. Then, everyone may draw differently. Since the animated characters in mind may not be the same. What kind of characters have red eyes? For example, Kurapika has red eyes. He is from the Kaluda race. When the Kaluda people get angry, their eyes will turn red. Kaguya also has red eyes. Because Kurapika is from the Dark Continent. After coming back, with the resources obtained from the Dark Continent. He forms the Shinomiya group. Kaguya is actually a descendant of Kurapika, but in her generation the red eyes phenotype becomes dominant. You don't have to get angry to turn the eyes red. So, both Kurapika and Kaguya 
have red eyes. So, drawing a character with the same red eyes may result in different red-eyed characters from different imaginations of people. At this time, we need to enable the machine to let our model be able to output a distribution. What other examples that needs creativity do we have? For example, conversation. We assume that you want to train a chatbot. You may need creativity. For example, we assume that you ask others that. Do you know who is Kaguya? There are actually many different correct answers, right? Kaguya is the vice president of the student union of private Shuchi in Gakuen. Recently, she did something indescribable with the president. I didn't say what it was. So, it's not a spoiler. But, we know that Kaguya actually has another achievement. Although Kagu Ya Himi, the animation, is not over yet. Its postquel has actually finished. Later on, she ro ga ne die young. So, Kagu Ya, dye her own hair white. And she wants to leave the sad earth. Thus, she takes a spaceship to another planet. There are some primitive creatures on another planet. Those creatures look similar to humans. They still live a farming life. Then, Kagu Ya sees the king of one of the small countries. He looks a bit like Shi Ro Ga Ne. So, she stays with the king of the small country. They have a child, who is the Li Ku Do Sen Nin. So, the age of ninja begins. It's really happy. It's really happy. So, what did we learn today? We learned that, the animation of Ka Gu Ya Sama, is really an amazing. It's actually a short story in the middle of two long novels. It is the postquel of the Hunter Hunter, and the prequel of the Naruto. These three stories can be connected together. That's it. So, when we say a word to the machine, to ask, who is Kaguya? Actually everyone may have different answers. This is exactly when, we need a generative model. One of the well-known, generative models, is the, Generative Adversarial Network. Its abbreviation is GAN. In this class, we will focus on the, Generative Adversarial Network. Before we discuss the Generate Adversarial Network, we have a very important problem. How do you pronounce G-A-N? This is how Mr. Google pronounces it. Gon Gon Gon. Basically it is Gur I'm. G-A-N. Actually has a lot of variations. Interestingly enough, you can find a Gen Zoo on GitHub. In the Gen Zoo, there are more than 500 kinds of Gen. Every time someone invents a new gen, he or she puts an English letter in front of gen as its name. But there are only 26 letters in English. So all the letters were used in a very short time. For example, in the gen zoo, there are at least six gans named S gen. All of them are different networks, but they share the same name S gen. Once upon a time, there was a paper proposing a model called Variational Autoencoding Gen. Theoretically, it should be named A.E. Gen or Again. But the author added the following comment. Oops, Agen had been used already. Also all the English letters seem to be unavailable. So I will call it Alpha Gen instead. There are just too many Gans. You can also compete with your classmates to see who can memorize more Gans. The task we are going to talk about later is to let the machine generate anime avatars faces we are going to solve the task with unconditional generation what is unconditional generation we will remove x first we will add it back later when we are discussing conditional generation but i will remove it first so the input to the generator is z and the output is y we will assume that z is a vector that is sampled from the normal distribution Usually, this vector is a low dimensional vector. You can change the dimension to any number you like, such as 50 or 100. The dimension of the vector is decided by you. So given any vector, which is a sample, taken from the normal distribution, give it to the generator, and the generator will give you a corresponding output. We want the corresponding output to be an anime style face. But how do we actually require the generator to output an anime style face this problem is not that difficult a picture is simply some very high dimensional vector so what the generator actually outputs 
is a high dimensional vector. For example, a 64 times 64 colored picture is a 64 times 64 times 3 dimensional vector. Manipulate with the vector, and you can reconstruct the image. This is exactly what the generator does. When the input vector is different, the output will change accordingly. Given any sample z taken from the normal distribution, the output y is different. What we want is that the generator always outputs an anime style face. Given any z. Some students might ask why we chose the normal distribution. Can it be some other distribution? Well, if I had chosen another, you would still ask the same question. My experience tells me that the difference between distributions may not be very big, but you can still find some literature that tries to explore the difference between the distributions. Here, you only need to choose a simple distribution because your generator will find a way to make this simple distribution correspond to a complex distribution. So, you can let your generator choose the distribution for you. In the later discussion, we assumed that it is a normal distribution. In GEN, something special is that, besides the generator, we have to train a something called discriminator. What does the discriminator do for? The role of this discriminator is that it will take a picture as input. What is its output? Its output is a numeric value. The discriminator itself is also a neural network. It is a function. It inputs something and outputs something. It inputs a picture and outputs a number. Its output is a scalar. The larger the scalar, the more likely. This picture input now looks like an image of a real two-dimensional character. For example, this is the avatar of the two-dimensional character. Then output 1, assuming 1 is the largest value. This one is also well drawn, just output 1. This will output 0.1 if you don't know what it is. This will output 0.1 if you don't know what it is. This is the job of the discriminator. As for the discriminator, and the architecture of the neural network, this is also completely designed by yourself. So, the generator, is a neural network. The discriminator, is also a neural network. What does their architecture look like? You can design it yourself. You can use CNN or Transformer as long as you can produce the input and output you want. That's it. In this example, the input of the discriminator is a picture. So you will choose CNN, right? CNN has a very big advantage in processing images. Since the input is a picture, your discriminator is very likely to have a lot of CNN architecture. As for what kind of architecture is used, this is all decided by yourself. It's up to you. Okay, what is the basic concept of GEN? Why do we need one more discriminator? Here is a story. This story is related to evolution. What is this? This is not a dead leaf. It's the mimicry of a dead leaf butterfly. The dead leaf butterfly looks very similar to the dead leaf. It can avoid predators. The ancestors of the dead leaf butterfly don't look like dead leaves. Maybe they were colorful. Why do they grow like dead leaves? Because of the pressure of natural selection. This is not an ordinary sparrow. This is Pidgey. Pidgey is not an ordinary sparrow. Pidgey will eat the ancestors of the dead leaf butterfly. Under the pressure of natural selection, the dead leaf butterfly becomes brown. Because Pidgey only eats colorful things. Pidgey sees colored things and knows it is a butterfly. Eat it. Pidgey sees something brown, and thinks it is a dead leaf. Pidgey is fooled. So, the ancestors of the dead leaf butterfly become brown, under the pressure of natural selection. Okay, but Pidgey will also evolve to eat these dead leaf butterflies, which look like a dead leaf. Pidgey also evolved. After Pidgey evolved, it becomes Pidgeotto. The Pidgeotto is more clever when it judges whether a butterfly can be eaten. It doesn't just look at the color, it looks at its veins. It knows that those without veins are butterflies, and those with veins are the real dead leaves. Under the pressure of natural selection, mimicry is induced in dead leaf butterfly with leaf veins. Butterflies want to fool Pidgeotto. But Pidgeotto may also evolve. What is the evolution of Pidgeotto? Pidgeotto can evolve to be Pidgeot. This is the Pidgeot. Pidgeot may be able to tell the difference between dead leaf butterflies and dead leaves. 
Okay, this is a story of evolution. Corresponding to Gen, the dead leaf butterfly is the generator, and its natural enemy is the discriminator. We hope our generator can draw images of anime avatars. How does the generator learn to draw anime avatars? The learning process is like this. The parameters of the first generator are almost. Its parameters are completely random. So it doesn't know how to draw anime avatars. The first generator draws some inexplicable noise. The next learning goal of discriminator is to distinguish the output of the generator from the real image. It may be very easy for discriminator in this example. Does it just need to see if there are two black balls, the eyes, in the image? Images with eyes are real anime avatars and without are productions from generator. Then generator can adjust its parameters. Generator evolved. The goal of its adjustment is to fool the discriminator. Suppose discriminator, judging whether a picture is true is based on if there are eyes. Generator produces eyes in the image and shows them to the discriminator. By doing so, generator can fool the first discriminator. But discriminator will also evolve. The first discriminator will evolve to be the second discriminator. The second discriminator will try to distinguish the difference between this set of images and the real image. It will try to find the difference between the two. For example, it found that the generated pictures are relatively simple. Neither hair nor mouth is in these images. Both hair and mouths are in these images. The third generator will find one way to fool the second discriminator. Since the second discriminator is looking for a mouth to judge the authenticity of anime avatars, the third generator will add a mouth to images. The discriminator will improve gradually. It will become more and more demanding. We hope that discriminator becoming more and more stringent. Images generated by generator become more and more like anime avatars. Because there is a generator and a discriminator, they interact with each other. At first, Gen is proposed by Ian Goodfellow in 2014. The paper If Gen is published in NIPS in 2014. The original paper of Gen, treats the generator and discriminator, as enemies. If you read a lot of internet articles introducing Gen, they give an example for making counterfeit bills. The generator is making counterfeit bills. The discriminator is a policeman. The police are going to catch someone who makes counterfeit bills. In consequence, counterfeit bills will become more and more real. The police will be better and better at catching these guys. Ian Goodfellow thought the generator and discriminator have an antagonistic relationship, so he used the word adversarial. In the original paper, adversarial means confrontation. As for generator and discriminator, are they fighting? This is just an anthropomorphic statement. On April Fool's Day, there was an internet article writing that we must not abuse artificial intelligence. We can't force artificial intelligence to kill each other. In the cockfighting ground, this is immoral. We should release these generators and discriminators. Okay, so whether they are adversaries is just a matter of analogy. You can also say that they are collaborating as both friends and enemies. So the relationship between the generator and the discriminator, in anime terms, is more like frenemies. Just like Hikaru and Akira. Or Naruto and Sasuke. Next, we will discuss how generator and discriminator works from an algorithmic point of view. So the following is the formal explanation of what this algorithm actually looks like. Generator and discriminator are two networks. Before training a network, you have to initialize its parameters first. So here we assume the parameters of generator and discriminator have been initialized. After the initialization, the first step of training is to fix your generator and only train your discriminator. Because at the beginning the parameters of your generator are initialized randomly, fixing your generator means it didn't do anything at all. Its parameters are all random. So when you throw a bunch of vectors to it, its outputs will be a mess. In fact, if the generator's parameters are initialized and not updated, you can't even produce results like this. Your results will look like the noise on a broken TV screen. Now, from this Gaussian distribution, you will randomly sample a bunch of vectors 
and throw these vectors into the generator. The generator will spit out some pictures that look nothing like normal anime characters. You will also have a database. In this database, there are many anime avatars. Just go to a gallery on the internet and you'll have it. This is not difficult to collect. From this database, you sample some avatars. Next, you take the real anime avatars and the results produced by the generator to train your discriminator. What is the goal of the discriminator's training? The goal of its training is to find the difference between the real anime avatars and the ones generated by the generator. To be more specific, your actual operation looks like this. You might label these real avatars as 1. The pictures generated by the generator are labeled as 0. Now, for the discriminator, this is a problem of classification or a problem of regression. If it is a classification problem, you just treat the real avatars as category 1 and these pictures generated by the generator as category 2. Then train a classifier and it is over. Or someone will treat it as a regression problem. Then you teach your discriminator to output 1 when it sees these pictures. Output 0 when it sees these pictures. Either way, the discriminator will learn to find the difference between the real images and the generated images. It won't matter if you treat it as a classification problem or a regression problem. After we finish training the discriminator, we fix the discriminator and train the generator. How to train the generator? A personified way to say this is to let the generator figure out a way to fool the discriminator. Because now the discriminator has learned to distinguish the difference between the real picture and the fake picture. It knows the difference between the real image and the generated image. If the generator can fool the discriminator by producing some pictures to let the discriminator think it is a real picture. The picture produced by the generator may look very real. So, how does this fooling work in practice? Its operation is like this. Here is a generator, and it operates on an input vector that is sampled from a Gaussian distribution. Then it generates an image. Next, we feed this image into the discriminator. The discriminator would give this image a score. The goal of the generator training. The parameters of the discriminator are fixed, and we would only update the parameters of the generator. The goal of the generator training is to maximize the output value of the discriminator. Because of the goal of the discriminator training, the objective of it is to give a good image a high score. If the generator can update the parameters, making the discriminator gives the generated image a high score, it means that the generated image is relatively real. More specifically, your operation is like this. The generator is a bunch of networks. Oh, it's not a bunch of networks. It's a network with several layers. The discriminator is also a network with several layers. We directly connect the generator and the discriminator and treat them as a large network. For example, if the generator has five layers and the discriminator has five layers, too, we connect them and treat them as a 10 layer network. In this 10 layer network, one of the hidden layers, its output is very wide. Its output dimension is the same as three times the number of pixels in an image. After the hidden layer, the output is processed and it would become an image. So in this large network, one of the hidden layer outputs represents an image. What are we going to do next? What we are going to do is the entire large network would operate on an input vector and outputs a score. Then we hope to update this network to make the output score the higher the better. Notice that we wouldn't update the discriminator part in this network. We wouldn't update the last few layers of the network. Why not update the last few layers? You can imagine that if we can update them, this entire game was hacked. Suppose the higher the score you want to output, you can directly update the bias of the output layer neuron. Isn't the output as huge? If we set it to 10 million, so the parameters of the discriminator couldn't be updated. We only update the parameters of the generator. Okay. As for how to update the parameters of the generator, the training procedure is the same as we trained other networks. 
there is no difference. When we trained a network before, you determined a loss function and used gradient descent to make the loss as small as possible. You also have a goal here. Instead of minimizing the target, the goal here is to maximize it. Of course, you can also multiply the target. That is, the discriminator output, a negative sign. You can treat it as a loss, right? You can make the output of the discriminator becomes negative like the loss. Then the goal of the generator training is to make the loss as small as possible. Or you can say, we just want to maximize the output value of the discriminator. Then we use gradient ascent. Instead of gradient descent, gradient descent is to minimize the loss. Gradient ascent is to maximize the objective function. We will use gradient ascent to update the generator to maximize the output of the discriminator. They are the same. How we train the generator also uses the gradient descent base method. There is no difference between it and how we trained a network before. Now, I've talked about two steps. The first step is to fix the generator and train the discriminator. The second step is to fix the discriminator and train the generator. Then, train the discriminator and generator repeatedly. After training the discriminator, fix the discriminator and train the generator. After training the generator, use the generator to produce new pictures to train the discriminator again. After training the discriminator, train the generator again. Train the two models repeatedly. You train the discriminator for a while. Then, you train the generator for a while. Then, train the discriminator again. Then, train the generator again. The generator and discriminator are trained repeatedly. When one of them is training, fix the other one. Then you expect the discriminator and generator can do better and better. Okay, the next homework is the face generation task of anime avatars. You might ask how do those pictures look? I have tried the task in 2017 and show you the results now. I trained the Gen by myself to analyze whether Gen produces two-dimensional characters. When I say training a hundred times, it means we train the generator and discriminator by turns a hundred times. The follow like below. Train the discriminator. Then, train the generator. Then, train the discriminator again. Then, train the generator again. And so on. After training a hundred times, it's the result. I can't understand what is the generator produces. I wait for a while. After training a thousand times, it's the result. The machine learns to produce the eyes. The machine knows that a human face needs two eyes. So it produces the eyes. After training two thousand times, you can observe that the machine learns to produce his mouth. After training five thousand times, it's starting to look like a human face. And you find that the machine learns that. Animated characters have big watery eyes. All of the faces contain big watery eyes. So you can observe that machine produces better and better. After training 10,000 times. The shape of the face has appeared. Just a little fuzzy. There are some faint places in the pictures. It looks like a watercolor painting. This is the result of 20,000 updates. This is the result of 50,000 updates. I stopped to train the model after 50,000 times. You can do better than this result in your homework. These are the results which produced by TA when they were students. So you may able to produce pictures like the results by yourself. You can find these characters are pretty good. However, the pictures still may be occasional crashes. If you have a good database, you may do better than the results. Of course, this is hard to achieve better performance. By using the dataset we provide to everyone. If you have a dataset that is good enough, you may produce surprising results. These results are found on the internet. These results are produced with style gen. I am very surprised that the performance of style gen is so good. It's amazing. These all characters are generated by gen. Here, the model produces heterochromia iridum. I am not sure that it should be fault or deliberate. But, it is still interesting. In addition to producing anime avatars, it can also generate real human faces. There is a model called Progressive Gen, which can generate very high resolution human faces. Let's take a test here. There are two rows of human faces. 
If you think the images in the top row are generated by the machine, please raise your hand. Okay, put down your hand please. If you think the images in the second row are generated by the machine, please raise your hand. Okay, there are more people. Put down urine please. In fact, both rows are generated by machines. Obviously, Progressive Gen has a way to generate lifelike human faces. Even, it is said that some people found that some profile pictures in a startup are weird. Then, they guessed that those pictures were actually generated by Gen. They're not real people. There aren't so many people in that startup. And they use Gen to generate some fake profile pictures. Then you may ask that. What's the benefit of generating human faces? Just taking a picture of someone on the road. Maybe more real. But with Gen, you can generate those faces you haven't seen. For example, if you use Gen, you can do something like this. We just said that for the generator in Gen, we use a vector as its input and it outputs a picture. Besides this, you can also do the interpolation on the input vectors. After interpolating the input vectors, what will happen? You will see the continuous changes between the two pictures. For example, if you put in a vector, and it generates a man who looks very serious. Then you put in another vector, and it generates a smiling woman. Afterwards, if you use the interpolation of these two vectors as the input, you will see the man gradually smile. There are more examples here. Here, note that the input vectors are fake, but the pictures produced here are real. If you give it a vector, it will generate a person looking to the left. If you enter another vector, it will generate another person looking to the right. What if we do the interpolation here? What will happen? The machine is not stupid. It will not merely stack two images together. The machine knows. The output of this interpolation vector should be a person looking straight ahead. You didn't actually tell this to your model. However, machines can learn by themselves. They learn the interpolation of these two faces. Should be a face looking straight ahead. When it comes to Gen, I have already said that. Gen is proposed by Ian Goodfellow. In 2014. You may have heard about the story of Gen. Yet I have no idea whether it is true or not. Ian Goodfellow went to a bar. And saw two people quarreling. Then he went home. And tried to implement the idea. Finally, he succeeded. And published a paper. But his so-called success is actually like this. In 2014, when I saw this result for the first time, I think wow, it can really generate pictures. It's so amazing. Of course, now we won't regard these pictures as a great success. Nowadays, pictures generated by Big Gen are like this. These pictures are all generated by the machine. Of course if you take a closer look, you can still find some flaws. For example, this dog has an extra leg. Also, this cup is not very symmetrical. These pictures are all generated by the machine. Sometimes the machine also generates some virtual characters. For example, the machine generates a tennis dog.